Hello and welcome everybody to January's Rowing Chat. It's a great pleasure to be back here after Christmas. Uh, our guest today is Peter Cookson. Peter, who are you and what do you do? Well, thanks, Rebecca, for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, Happy New Year to all your listeners. It's um, been a very chilly and cold start to Canada, in Canada here, but um, we're getting on with it and um, my responsibility is, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'll start with my title. I'm the High Performance Director for Rowing Canada. Uh, the High Performance Director is essentially responsible for the planning, uh, creating, and managing of all aspects of Rowing Canada's High Performance Program. And that High Performance Program includes all of our entities that um, race internationally. So that includes the Junior Program, uh, the under-23 program, and the senior program. It, the only thing it does not cover is the master's program. So part of my, res part of my responsibility, of course, is, is the uh, creation of the strategic direction for the high-performance program. Uh, I'm responsible for the hiring of all of the personnel, uh, including coaches for Rowing Canada. And also liaising with our various partners out there, such as FISA, uh, our, our funding partners here in Canada, other NSOs, which are national sport organizations from, from within Canada and also other countries, rowing federations. So quite a wide, varied job. job. It uh, encompasses all aspects of what a high performance program um, deals with. Essentially, our job, my job, is to ensure that we have sustainable success at World Championships and Olympic Games. Uh, as you can imagine, it's always a work in progress trying to get to that point, but something that obviously in the rowing world is quite an important one. I mean, it is the pinnacle of the sport getting to uh, cruise into the Olympics and then performing there. So um, that is ultimately, ultimately my responsibility to get crews up to that level through, through the good work of our coaches and our support staff um, and uh, getting there and being able to perform. So your job is, is kind of your Mr. Invisible, the uh, high profile public sees the athletes and some of the better known coaches quite often I guess they get the media interviews so is is this the first time that you've been approached for an interview? <laughs> well it actually hasn't been that many times you read it's mainly the coaches and rightfully so and the athletes who who are the ones getting the uh, um, the interest and that's the way it should be it's all about the athletes and of course the coaches are there to help them get them get on the way and the way I view my job is my job is to hire um, good people into positions and let them get on with the job and do what they're, they're hired to do. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, of course, that um, means that you have to support those people you bring into the program. And um, it is all part and parcel of, of what we call a high-performance program. It's, uh, it's quite complicated. There's a lot of moving parts to it. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're always looking to say, how can, we, how can we make ourselves that little bit better than our competition? And of course, that's the sort of challenge that every organization, I think, that uh, has ambition likes to set itself. Now, Canada is a very big country, you're a native, and you have these horrible frozen winters that you've already alluded to. How do you manage a training program at the international level that presumably has to continue all year round when most of the country is under snow and ice for a few months? Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting one, and I think there's a lot of different schools of thought on it. Um, clearly, we do rely on a leather, other types of interventions in terms of training um, in a lot of uh, our parts of Canada. There are a, one or two areas in Canada where you can row uh, on a year-round basis, but the majority of the country is, is locked into snow and ice from sometime, well, it can be as early as October right through to April, May. Um, <laughs> So, but that's not for all of the country. From the high performance side of things, obviously we take advantage of, of our neighbors down to the south of us. So we do spend a lot of time in the U.S. Uh -huh. um, for some of our programs in terms of having training camps. Um, but as an example, um, our, our women's, women and lightweight men's programs, which are based in London, Ontario, they do spend a lot of time indoors during, during this period. Uh, mm -hmm. So they'll go down for periods down to the, down to the U.S. and they'll then they'll come back up to Canada do periods indoor in our indoor training center, mm -hmm. which is essentially a lot of strength and conditioning, 
uh, a lot of ergometer work, a lot of other plyometric work, just to ensure that they, uh, when they get back on the water, they're ready to go. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. We haven't done any real, I guess, studies to determine whether one is better than the other, but we do know we've had success out of both centers, the one in Victoria, which where they can row all year round, and the one also in London where, with, where they can't row all year round. So um, it is interesting, and, um, but I, I do know that um, no matter what situation it is, you can make it work as long as you put the elements into place to, to make it uh, uh, productive for the athletes. Yeah, that's uh, always the way, isn't it? There is no one way of, of making fast crews. Now, let's move into uh, some of the questions that we're getting in from our audience. Um, John in Oxford is asking, what's the structure of rowing Canada? Is it conducive to attracting and retaining a good depth of athlete? Well, that's a good question. Um, certainly from the senior level, which are those who are, I guess, our senior world championship and, and Olympic athletes, we do operate a two-center system and those centers are open year-round for athletes. We have one center in Victoria which is where our, our men train and we have another center in London, Ontario where our women and lightweight men train. So just to confirm that's the west coast and very nearly the east coast so they're split. Yeah, essentially, and that, there's a long history to that. We've been operating a centralized system since about 1990, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just the way it's kind of evolved over the years into, into that situation. Um, like I said to you earlier, they both have been very productive in those centers. The athletes are there effectively year-round, obviously with a little break after a World Championships or an Olympic Games, but they are there for the most part on a year-round basis. And that allows, of course, a whole bunch of different variables to be taken care of um, within the centers. Um, for instance, the coach has a lot of control over the ac actual training that's taking place. Um, there's certainly a lot of um, competitive atmosphere when you have all the athletes in one, in one center pushing each other. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some real positives to that. And uh, there are um, economies of scale as well when you're, ha when you're operating systems in or operating a system that allows only two centers as opposed to five or six, yeah. um, which we could easily do across Canada with the size of it, but it's um, also it's just a, ma a matter of financial aspects as well. We have to ensure that we're prudent with what, uh, with what funds we do have. How do you recruit athletes and select them from you know, raw, 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 raw people who haven't yet gotten noticed? Well, we're always looking for, for more athletes. I think it's one of the challenges that you know, most rowing programs and probably most sports face. We're always looking for, um, for, a, for a really deep pool of athletes to, to draw on to, to be successful. Um, we have in Canada over the past few years, we've established a, a more structured development program. Um, I think that, that kind of bolts onto our um, into, onto our club system, which is historically and will continue to be a large provider of athletes to our national program. So through our clubs, universities, schools, um, those are the, major the majority of athletes for our national programs um, come from those. And on top of that, we have this bolt-on development program that actively goes out and searches for athletes um, to, to further bolster our, our pool of athletes. And that's run by Pete Shakespeare, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Um, Peter has been with us now for a little over a year. He's um, obviously a very experienced and knowledgeable and um, a leader in, in this area. Um, he's made some significant changes to the way we operate our development system. I think it's becoming more entrenched in our system. Um, but I do need to add that it will never take away from the importance of the clubs and, and the universities and schools and their, um, and their ability and their um, well, what we require them, I guess, to to produce athletes, provide athletes that are capable of going on to the highest levels of the sport. So I guess uh, young people in Canada, a lot of them choose to study at universities in the States, but possibly also further afield. Do you fly them home for trials or do you not consider them because they're not in the country? No, we certainly um, try to keep tabs on all of the all the, the those athletes who choose to go to the U.S. I mean, obviously, it would be better from our point of view, and that's being selfish if they did stay in Canada. But we know that's um, we know that it, there's a strong desire and there's um, a strong pull to go down to some of the um, U.S. colleges. And to be fair to that, they, a lot of those those U.S. universities offer great programs and great coaching. And so, what we try to do is 
is to provide um, a conduit for those coaches and athletes, um, for, mainly for the athletes to 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 um, be part of our system. And mm -hmm. so we try to work closely with the U.S. college coaches to ensure that there's some sort of uh, ability for the athletes to come back when needed mm -hmm. um, for mm -hmm. our programs. That's great. There's even a question from the audience here, um, which you've obviously alluded to a little bit in your mention of the um, recruitment and development program, but Train Harder uh, is his login and he's asked, what is the strategy for boosting performance? Um, well, obviously, um, it, you know, the first aspect that our development program looks at, we're looking for athletes who have um, the right attributes. And that goes from an anthrop anthropometric um, side, but also from the physiological side. So a good engine, and they're the right size. Um, and, those, and then, of course, you have to train it properly. And um, you, can't, you, know, you can't get away from the fact that rowing is um, it's a power sport. It relies on a, uh, a significant amount of training volume. Mm -hmm. um, so we spend a lot of time, particularly with those athletes that uh, we have found through our development system, first of all, is teaching them to how to row properly. Mm -hmm. uh, so the progression along the technical scale is what we consider to be of, of the highest priority. And of course, at the same time, develop, developing that ability to train to the right volumes. And that can take some time, as you, as you can well imagine. Um, you can't ask somebody to sort of jump into a program and do the, the type of volume that somebody who's been in it for four or five years has been doing. So we spend a lot of time trying to measure and monitor the athletes as they're, as they're developing into um, the type of athlete that we're looking for. Mm. And this you expect obviously then to filter up through once they get selected at junior or under 23 level. Yeah, that's correct. I think, um, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no shortcuts in any of this, um, in any development. It's, it's really what, what, what Shakespeare likes to refer to as smart development or smart tracking of people as opposed to fast tracking them. Mm. So well, it's, go on. So it's ensuring that you know, we're doing the right things with the athletes at the right stages to get up to the, um, to the required level. We've got another question from a listener um, who's asking, how do the clubs contribute competitive athletes? Here in the US, clubs and schools are quite separate. Well, um, I think it, you know, it's not that dissimilar, dissimilar in Canada. There are uh, um, a lot of the schools that row out of clubs and there are some separate schools that um, you know, have their own programs and their own, um, you know, their own setups. Uh, but we encourage all, all schools and all clubs and all university athletes to take part in what a program that we call the radar program, which is essentially a country-wide monitoring system that um, allows athletes to participate um, on, in basically doing ergometer tests about four times a year, three to four times a year. Um, it allows us to give a, to have quite a deep, um, I guess, data bank of, of uh, performances. Um, we can see the progress of athletes if they continue to participate. Um, and then, of course, ones that we um, that we identify or are identified by their coaches or through this the radar system, we do try to encourage them to come out to our trials and to, our, um, to some of the camps that we do have. So um, we're trying to integrate it as much as possible with, of course, all of the varying and moving parts out there, but mm -hmm. um, it is something that we continue to, to try to on to just try to make our system a bit uh, more refined um, yeah. almost on a daily basis. Fantastic. All right, we're moving on to a question from Robert from ARC who wants to know, how do you coach an efficient catch that achieves maximum speed quickly? Well, I guess we're talking about the holy grail of rowing, aren't we? That's one thing that I think every coach is always trying to improve upon in terms of just maximizing your boat velocity. And um, of course, that um, there's a number of factors at play, as we're all aware of, when we get out into a boat and trying to ensure that we uh, maximize our our boat speed and minimize our, our boat speed loss. And um, the one um, thing we do know about the catch is that um, it has to be timed pretty accurately or very accurately with, um, with the, the placing of the blade with the push on the foot stops. And if we're, if we're pushing off on the, on the feet prior to putting the blade in the water, we know that has a pretty significant effect on the acceleration of the boat. Um, and so consequently, you, the, you end up putting the blade in the water and then you're having to, to pick up a lot of that speed that you've lost basically because you haven't timed it properly. It's really no different than 
um, what you would find in a golf stroke or um, a lot of other sports. You have to have the timing of these things uh, proper so that you can maximize your effect on it or your performance. So we do spend a lot of time, um, our coaches spend a lot of time working on that particular aspect of making sure the timing of that blade entry and then picking up um, the water on the, on the face of the spoon is aligned with the, the pushing of their, of their legs. Um, we're somewhat fortunate, I guess, is that we do have access to quite a bit of biomechanical equipment that we can put on boats to measure that. Um, but I think that only confirms what a coach already sees, and that is basically that that timing and that ability to maintain or minimize any loss of speed at that catch is, is critical, and you can do that best by ensuring that you, you um, organize yourself properly on the recovery and that you then place that blade into the water at the timing of the push with the legs, and that's how you, that's how you effectively, effectively um, maximize your speed. Peter, you're demonstrating the fact that uh, you failed to mention earlier, which is that you're a very experienced coach before you became a high performance director. Peter used to run uh, CRC sculling camps in the UK, and that was, uh, in fact, how we first met. I've got a question now from Andrew from Shrewsbury School in the UK, uh, which I think is very pertinent to a lot of coaches who are seeking to improve their skills. During a work piece on the water, how much input from the coaching launch is necessary and what's the balance between technical and motivational calls? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question and um, I think it's probably a very personal one for a lot of coaches as well. Um, I, I assume when, when Andrew is talking about a work piece, he's talking about those pieces where you're actually pushing quite hard. It's not just a, a technical piece, but it's a, it's a hard push piece. and. Um, now, I always think that you need to say the right things. You don't want to say too much. I think that it gets lost. Um, obviously, when you have a bunch of athletes out there and they're working very hard, um, they want to know that they're doing it well, but they don't want to have, they don't want, they're already stimulated. They don't want to be overstimulated. And I think you, um, as a coach, you have a responsibility to just think about what you're saying and ensure that you're saying the right things and positively motivating um, your athletes as they're going through. Um, I think we've all had you know, those rowing pieces where they're, they're very difficult and they're very hard and you're feeling you can't go one more stroke and the coach says, okay, I want you to do more. And, and, and when that's said in the right way, and, you know, in the right context, I, I can tell you that most athletes will dig down that little bit deeper and they will find that ability to push even harder or do more. And I think that's the, the art of being a coach is knowing the right time and the right place to say things. And um, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a big part of coaching. It certainly is. I mean, from my own experience, uh, when I was coaching, we would often do not just one piece, but several during an outing. We tend to have one technical focus, and I would limit myself during the pieces to only saying when they were achieving the technical focus that I wanted or when they had lost it and needed to refocus on it. Yeah, and I think that's a very good way to approach it. And sometimes, as you know, the, the, we can make the... The stroke, even though it appears on the surface to be um, quite a simple um, process, this actually can be quite complicated. And sometimes, when we're uh, when we're coaching, we try to bring in too much, and uh, then it becomes <laughs> a lot of it becomes lost. So I think the focus on one or two aspects of the stroke when you're doing those things is 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 a good way to do it. Moving on to a question from Sharon, who's also from Oxford. We seem to have a wonderful uh, Oxford listenership. Welcome to all of you, and she's from the City of Oxford Rowing Club and asks. How best do you manage diversity of experience and ambition in a squad? Yes, an interesting question. And uh, certainly I hope, um, at least from athletes that are aspiring to be Olympians and part of our team, that I don't, I don't need to worry too much about their ambition. It should be, <laughs> it should be very evident, I think, at that point. But I can understand within, within club contexts where it might be um, different and varying for um, for the uh, um, for different athletes within within that club or that university or that school. I always remember back when uh, when I was coaching. One of my um, it was I was a fairly young coach at the time, and I was putting together a, a, a men's eight to compete at a fairly major event in the in the United States. And we had a solid group ro working throughout the winter period. And um, when it got to the springtime, uh, one of the one of the eight 
um, had to had to unfortunately drop off due to uh, an injury. We had one or two others on the periphery as part of that group, and, um, but one of them um, um, was unfortunately all not that fit, even though he had trained with the group all year, was just not the fittest guy in the group. And so we spent um, a lot of time when we um, ended up having to make the decision to have this particular person in the, in the crew. Um, we spent a lot of time working with that particular person at a really low level, to be honest with you, to ensure that he was brought up to the same level as the other guys who had been training hard all year. And I was really worried that we would lose out, the, you know, the top guys would lose out on some of the fitness. And, um, but we managed it in such a way that we really brought this, 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 this chap who wasn't quite as experienced or as fit as the other guys up to a pretty high standard by the time we got to that race. And my, I remember the reaction of the crew. They did quite well at the race that we went to. And um, I remember the reaction of, of the, the other guys in the crew at that point. Just a note to all listeners on Rowing Chat currently, we are having small technical difficulties and we'll be back with you in just a moment. Hello. Cheers. Okay, Peter. Hi, but yeah. Sorry, my computer crashed. That was hideous. Oh. Uh, so, um, what I'm going to do is I'm rebooting, and uh, Theo set us live again. Okay, I was worried that it was me. I thought, oh no, I didn't touch anything. <laughs> right, as you were. Sorry, you were finishing the anecdote about the uh, the reaction of the crew after they'd done quite well in the race. Okay. And uh, I, I guess uh, I, I was just saying that you know that particular crew where we had um, quite a few good athletes in that boat, and they were just really pleased that they that that I as a coach had the patience to bring this person up because they felt that was most important than anything. It, it just brought everyone together, uh, and luckily for that athlete who wasn't as fit, he he actually rose to the challenge and. And um, it was a really pleasing experience, and one of my really one of the highlights of my coaching career was the, the ability for that crew to come together like they did and perform as well as they did, given some of the circumstances. So, your advice then to uh, Sharon from Oxford is to seek a common goal in order to manage this diversity. I think that's really important, and I think as long as everyone understands each other's goals for what they want to get out of it, I think that you know that leads to. Um, I think some very good camaraderie and, and, and it allows people to get on with it and it's sometimes when you do have diverse goals or, or they don't quite align that's where you can have some of the challenges that do arise um, but, I, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident in any club program that when you do align those goals with, um, with, with, the, uh, with the program then you can have a significant and good results and the results don't always mean winning. It just means that you're able to conclude your season or your time there with um, feeling really great about what you've done as an athlete or as a person. Fantastic. Following on from that, we've got a question from Elizabeth who's in Rochester, New York, and she's asking, what have you found to be your most successful techniques for team building? <laughs> Good question. I remember back in uh, 2009 when I had just started in my role, we had made a decision at that time. It wasn't very often where the men and the women trained together. 
Um, and so we made a decision at that time where we would bring the women and the men together um, in actually in, in San Diego for have a winter training camp all together. Um, and the women were worried they had come they had come from um, coming from the east and they were going with the men who um, who had been on the water and the women were worried that they wouldn't be able to you know to handle the load of of going into the men's program and handling it. But um, I, I didn't think quite the same as they did. I think I thought they could handle it quite well. Um, they went into that training camp and two, three, four, five, six days, seven days into it, the women were just flying along and having a wonderful, wonderful tramp, a camp. So were, the, so were the men, mind you, but it was just a wonderful um, experience for the women. It was a really great, um, I think, bonding effort for the women to recognize that, you know, that they could do it. Now, this was coming into a, a men's program that had just been successful the year before by winning uh, an Olympic gold medal in the eight and a couple other good performances in the, like in the men's pair. So it was a very strong men's program. And the women came on into that um, not knowing what to expect and um, they came out with, with flying colors. And I always thought, well, um, sometimes you have to challenge yourself. And part of it, part of building a team is, is just recognizing that, um, um, you know, everyone can add value to it. And, and, and don't be afraid to challenge yourself and get out there and you'll be impressed and surprised by what you can do. Um, so that was one, one thing that really taught me a lesson in terms of um, team building. Um, the women went on to have um, quite a few successful years after that and still are continuing to be successful. Um, and I, I think that one particular camp was kind of the turning point for them to, to get to that point uh, for that. That's a fantastic story and um, certainly uh, shows, shows up that one of the psychologies of, of women athletes, particularly in my experience when they're in a group, is they can talk themselves down into a position of negativity terribly easily. Yeah, I think that's not just with women. It could be with, you know, I've seen it um, with many athletes and part of a coach's role and responsibility is to try to keep that positive uh, momentum going and ensuring that the athlete um, um, feels like, you know, knows where they stand and, and, and supports that athlete. I think that's a big part of uh, my role is just to ensure that the athlete always feels supported um, through through their coaches. So, um building it building a team of course is is knowing that everyone within that within that um, program feels supported that's a great uh, link into our next question from mark who's from ankham rowing club in uh, north lincolnshire in the uk and he's asking how do you build a team with varied abilities yeah another good question um you, you have some very shrewd listeners out there Rebecca. <laughs> You know, building a team with varied abilities. I guess um, I'm going to go refer back to some of my my coaching experiences, um, and also then I'll refer to some of my experiences in the role I presently have. Um, when when I used to coach at one particular club, um, it was um, a, it was a quite a large club. We had a wide variety of athletes, um, of men and women, um, lightweights, heavyweights, juniors, um, seniors, uh, just a, a, a wide range of, of athletes and ability. And what we did as a club, we sat down, um, we sat down together with the athletes and not just myself, but also our other coaches and, and also even our, um, um, the board of directors with that particular club. And we sat down and we set a vision for the club and knowing that there was this wide range of abilities. And it was, obviously some of it was directed at performance, um, winning so many medals at certain events, and, and, um, and some of it was essentially, well, um, let's, <laughs> something very simple, let's, let's just make sure the clubhouse is clean on a regular basis and here's how we're going to do that. So it was a wide range of things that we put together to try to set our plan for this particular um, this particular group. But the interesting s part of that is that once we set those goals for the team, and for that particular club, it was really fascinating how everyone picked their game up. Mm. So from those who were already closer to the top of the group, if you like, right down to the people who were fairly new to the sport and hadn't been in it that long, and how, how having that team vision for where we were going, how it really improved 
um, the team itself. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a fascinating experience, I guess, for myself and the psychology of how um, having a collective group effort can, can make great things happen. And um, isn't it interesting how often that effort comes from things that appear to be very mundane? Absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that I know that um, our coaches preach a lot here in Canada, the ones at, the, you know, at our senior level, is they preach about how ensuring that all the little things are done properly because they add up to great things. That's fantastic perception. One of the uh, anecdotes I had from my time at Tideway Scholars, who was a, a high performance club, but with again a wide range of abilities, um, we needed to sort of overcome some of the barriers between the different training groups because we had men, women, we had juniors, we had masters. And uh, the club instigated a bar rotor in between outings at weekends where each group took it in turn to make the tea and coffee and sell the toast and jam. And because you had to come face to face with somebody you didn't know once a month and say, hello, can I have two cups of tea and three slices of toast? People began to get to know each other and it was fantastically successful. Well, and, and that's the nature of a club, isn't it? Is that you do get to know everyone within your club and that's, that sounds like a fantastic program. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were very fortunate. We've had an observation here uh, from uh, one of the listeners who says positivity normally comes from within or the coxswain, he thinks, or a pricey sports psychologist, but he thinks that's a no-go in the amateur game. But uh, what would you think? Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Posit that, 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 uh, sorry, say that one more time, Rebecca. That the actual po question. Positivity mm -hmm. is a no-go in the amateur game. And unless you have a pricey sports psychologist or a coxswain, possibly you are a coxswain, train harder? Well, <laughs> um, I, I guess I would beg to differ a little bit. I think that um, positiveness does come from within the athlete and there is um, certainly um, the most people that I know have made it to um, the very highest level of the sport have always had a very um, positive outlook, if you like, on, on so many things. Um, and they have a sereneness about them that just allows them to um, to do what they need to do. A lot of them. There are some who are obviously different than that, or wired quite the, slightly different than that. So I would, you know, it's it is an interesting one. I think that um, there are certainly um, aspects of of negativity that do creep into certain things. But I think for the most part, you have to always and um, you know most most great performances come from when there's a really good feeling within uh, whatever you're doing. Understand and respect that totally. Now moving on to our sponsor. This week the sponsor is the Row Perfect Best Sellers. These are the most popular products in the Row Perfect UK online store. You can get yourself some Stampfly grips which are sold at the lowest price in the UK or maybe a copy of the FISA Sculling DVD, which was produced by Peter Cookson's team. How about a Sculler's rear view mirror, a micro impeller for your boat speed measurement, or coaches spanners? Visit rowperfect.co.uk forward slash shop for a full listing of our best selling products. Now, Stanny, who doesn't say where they're from, asks, what do you believe are the top three things to do in order to improve rowing performance? Yeah, good question. And I think one that obviously, um, I guess if I had to think the top three things you need to do to improve rowing performance. Row rowing is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a volume sport. So the one, the one particular thing that you need to do to performance, you need to do the, the right amount of work uh, at the right intensity at the right times of the year. So having a, a really solid yearly training plan that, that lays it out for you in terms of that is important in terms of um, improving rowing performance. Um, secondly, rowing well rowing technically well to ensure that you're moving with the boat, that you are, you are doing the stroke really well to maximize the boat speed. It is, um, it's one of the more difficult ones and one of the challenging ones, of course, and sometimes I think we forget how important um, technique is in, in, in rowing. And 
I even see it at the international level where sometimes I think we're, we're losing a little bit of focus on the on the technical aspect of the sport um, in, in four and in, in making it up for unbelievable physical specimens who are out there doing the sport. So it is still important, I think, for, for everyone to, to row well, to maximize um, the way you're moving your body to ensure the optimum boat speed. So that's, that's the second one. And the third one, of course, um, is that you are um, racing and learning to race in the appropriate manner. So it is all well and dandy to go out there and train um, to the right level, but you also have to get into the, you know, have to get into the into the fire if you like, and get in there and get into a really some really tough races and learn how to win. You know, I always say that there's three stages to rowing that you have to go through. The first one is you have to learn how to row. The second one then is you have to learn how to race, and the third one is you have to learn how to win. And athletes can't miss any of those stages. It's a very simplified form of long-term athlete development, but um, it's it's true in some respects, and um, you know those three things: learning to row, learning to race, and learning to win are all critical athletes are all critical elements of an athlete's development. Um, we have some people who 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 learn to win fairly quickly, um, and then it's the ability to maintain that when you get into different situations and um, different different types of races where you run into some um, different conditions or you have somebody who, who gets out off, off the line very quickly. You think, okay, how do I handle this? Or you have uh, other things happening. For instance, you, you might run into a boy at the 400 meter mark and you get behind by half a length. What happens? How do you respond to that? So those are all elements in terms of trying to, uh, learning to race and learning to win. Um, when we go back to the first element, the learning to row, of course, that, that covers all elements. It, it requires the training side of things, the technical side of things, the psychological side of things, um, the lifestyle side of things, all those elements that are important when you're learning to row that, um, that will help you as you go forward in the sport. Do you think those are pretty much the same at the elite level? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, the elite level is, is really just a... Um, a slightly higher level than than what you would find at the domestic level, and learning to learning to race at a at a World Cup or a World Championship or a um, or a Junior World Championship or a or a Under Twenty Three World Championship. Those are all those are all building blocks, and and um, to get you up to that highest level. And I think it is important you learn how to race. And um, I think we've all had some races where if you had um, you, you, you wish you could take it back because you didn't do something right. And it's all those little building blocks um, that you need to build on, one, one on top of the other to ensure that by the time you get to the pinnacle of your sport, you've, you've really learned to win. Um, it doesn't happen to everybody, um, but ideally through, the, through a systematic approach, that's what you would get to. So moving on to a question from Anne, who's in St. Paul, Minnesota at Minneapolis Rowing Club. She says, I was coached by a Canadian coach for a few years. Are you still focusing on long with an extended layback, then strong, and then rating will come last? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that refers back to the um, days, those of you who will remember a little bit of rowing back in the um, mid-2000, there was... Um, one particular Canadian crew, the men's eight, that was coached by Mike Sprackton that went, had had extended layback. And that particular crew was uh, very successful. And so it became kind of an adopted um, technique, if you like, or style around the world in terms of um, how to row. But if you ask um, Mike Sprackton about that, his answer to it is, well, I actually never taught them that they needed to row with that layback. That wasn't what I was coaching. What I was, he said, his answer was, what I was coaching was length, then power, and then rate. And uh, Mike was a proponent, or is a proponent of doing a lot of, a lot of low rate. And of course, if you want to go faster, if you're doing side by side pieces and you've got four or five or six other pairs beside you or singles beside you, the one way, if you have a controlled rate, if it's 18, you can't go above the rate of 18. Uh, you can't put any more power on it. So what is the one thing you would do to try to get your nose in front of the other crew? Well, you would row longer mm -hmm. and that would be that layback. And that's where that came from. So it was never really a Canadian style. 
It was more a function of the way that was um, that happened with that particular group of guys. Um, it ended up being very successful. It is not something that was taught. It was just something that developed as part of that unique um, group of group of individuals. Okay, so Marlene from British Columbia at Royal Row is asking, what do you think are the factors that contribute to an athlete's longevity in elite rowing? Longevity, yeah, that's uh, certainly something that we would love to see in terms of um, athletes sticking around for you know, two or three Olympics because you learn, I think the first Olympics you go to in terms of, um, you know, for at least in the sport of rowing, it's, it's a pretty awesome and amazing experience and um, many athletes learn a lot um, during that first phase and some of them are not as successful as you would hope they would be during that first at first um, Olympics and so we try to encourage athletes to stay around for two to three Olympiads because we know that um, a couple of factors um, that they bring first of all they've had the experience of being to the to the show if you like um, and secondly, they're that much older and that much more wise in terms of being able to direct some of the younger athletes in the program. So we try to put a lot of emphasis on, on having athletes um, remain in the sport um, for that period of time. Some of the things that we've done is um, obviously it's, um, rowing is not the most uh, financially rewarding um, sports that are out there. Um, but we, tr we do try to ensure that our athletes are... Um, taken care of through certain, through certain programs. In Canada, we're quite fortunate. We have something called the carding program um, that allows athletes to receive uh, um, a small amount of uh, funding each month. Um, but we also top that up with different programs to just to try to give them a lifestyle that will at least allow them to um, maintain um, at least a reasonable level of, of, of income while they're, while they're rowing. And uh, it's been fairly successful. We do get quite a few athletes returning for, the, um, for our second or third Olympic uh, um, quadrennial. Um, but it is, it is just one factor. Certainly, you need to take into account um, the training, make sure that it's interesting and exciting for the athletes to, to want to come back. Um, and also ensuring that there's a level of stability within the program to allow them to uh, or make them want to come back. Um, you know, if these athletes are coming back, you, they want to be successful. They're not coming back just to go through another four years of what's really tough training. They're coming back to be successful. So trying to put together all the different elements that make a program successful is what's critical to them as well. So, and those can include um, a number of things. You know, one of the, we talk about um, within the high performance environment of having four essential pillars um, to ensure um, success and one of those of course is providing um, a, a high world-class leading uh, daily training environment and that includes what you do on the water what you do on the what you do on the land um, and includes also a competition structure that allows the athletes to really perform um, the second pillar is our system development what kind of system do we have around the athletes to to support them yeah, uh um, the, third, the third pillar that we try to ensure that is in place is that we have uh, a sports science and sport medical and innovation system around the athletes to always ensure that we can go a little bit more with the athlete. How can we help them improve that little bit more? And of course, the fourth one is having a really sound and, and good technical team around those athletes, which includes the coaches and other support staff that we have around the athletes. So that's how we do it in Canada. We try to make sure those four pillars are always um, uh, trying to improve upon them um, and of course providing that um, just those incentives for the athletes to stay around because of what because of the value they provide in going through it a second or, or third time. And of course in any um, Olympiad uh, it tends to build of course to the peak in the Olympic year um, and so that leads on to a question from Lubo in Montreal from Africa Montreal Rowing which is in your opinion, has the Canadian team been successful in the past two years? Yeah, um, probably it's one of the burning questions within Canada. What does successful mean? And, and certainly, um, we had um, two medals at the at the 2012 Games: one from the men's aid and one from the women's aid. And that was probably a bit. In fact, it was um, below um, what we had well, below our expectations. But then. 
and we reflected upon that and probably our expectations were probably um, a little bit too high given the reality of where we were in some of our, in some of our crews. And um, it is one of the things that we always are trying to balance is the expectations have to meet the reality. Um, so it's great to hope that you're going to win this, but you actually have to have uh, all the pieces there to ensure that you can do that as opposed to just hoping or expecting you're going to do that. It is, you know, I always like to say that the, you're only as good as your training and preparation. If you haven't trained and prepared properly, then, you're, um, then you can't expect great results. You've got to make sure those things are, are in place. So um, in the past two years, I think we've seen um, the emergence of a, of a, of a strong women's program. Uh, at least in Canada, uh, from the senior level, we have um, developed some sculling athletes that now are capable of getting onto the podium. Um, the the sweep program is still, um, I think, quite strong and developing further still. Um, and we're seeing that filter down even at the under twenty three level. We've had successful under twenty three levels at the at the women's level, and um, it is something that we'll obviously try to continue over the next few years. Um, the men's side, I think, has been. Um, I think I can. It's it's no understatement to say that not 2013 was uh, disappointing. Um, they they were certainly performances that, um, particularly the athletes didn't didn't uh, appreciate. So they'll, um, I'm sure they'll be back um, to better things this year. They've been working really hard this winter. It's been um, pretty interesting to watch how the, the physiological changes that have been happening within that program. So it's been good to see. Um, so all in all, I think it's been, I think, a mixed bag um, from a Canadian rowing side of things. I don't think it's been particularly overly successful. Um, when I first took on this job, I knew that it would be about an eight-year job to, to, to make a system that was, could be sustainably successful. I'm a little over halfway through that now. Um, so I know there's still a few more years before we get to that point. Um, but it is all part and parcel, I think, of building a system is that it does take time. Um, you've got to put into a, a lot of moving places, uh, moving pieces, you have to put them into the right place. Um, and I think we're finally getting close to that point where now we can consolidate and start building on some of those things that we put into place. And uh, ideally over the next few years, we'll see better and better Canadian results. A last question from Christopher in London from ULBC. He says, is that um, possible that the poor performance last year from the men was an effect of Mike Spracklin leaving? I, I don't think it was a direct impact of Mike leaving. I think there were a number of factors that were at play um, last year. Obviously, Mike is a very, very good coach. And, um, um, but uh, having said that, we also have good coaches in place at the present time. And I think it was more of a function of, of timing of things with the, with the incoming new coaches, some of the athletes coming back at a, um, a little bit later into the, into the year than we had hoped for. Um, so we were probably a little bit low on our depth chart last year in terms of um, the athletes and, and uh, where they stood from the from the prep being prepared for the world championships. We weren't ready for it. Um, so I think those performances, I'm, I would hazard to say, were more of a a one-off as opposed to what you'll see consistently from these guys in the future. They're they're very talented athletes, and I think we'll see a lot more from them um, this this year. And for future years. So you're planning a men's eight for Rio, are you? Um, what we're planning is to have the best crews that we can put forward onto the water, whatever they may be. Um, so obviously we, we assess everything as it goes along. Mm -hmm. And when we get to a point where we need to make decisions, obviously um, the most critical year of this quadrennial was 2016, but the second most critical year is 2015, the year that we need to qualify. Yeah. So I guess you know through this year and through early next year, we'll make those final decisions on what boats we're going to put forward to qualify. Then. Um, then get those boats ready for, for Rio in 2016. Fabulous. Well, I wish you all the best with that. We're moving on now to the time where we take some questions from the listeners live. And uh, the first one is from uh, uh, Train Harder, who says, uh, what about the transfer between sports, i.e. rowing, losing athletes to cycling? Um, where do you think the inflow of new athletes is coming from? And this obviously isn't a Canadian problem, or a problem unique to Canada. It's definitely been seen in, in other countries. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, but I think that also row, rowing has benefited um, from some athletes coming into the sport from other sports. So um, there are um, a number of avenues for athletes to go, and they're going to go where they feel they have the best opportunity. It's just like 
water will flow to where it's, you know, where it, <laughs> downhill to where it can go to. And I think athletes will be the same way, is that they'll go to where they feel they have the best opportunity. Um, obviously, we are always trying to encourage some athlete transfer, talent transfer towards our sport. Um, and likely, um, there's many other sports out there who are trying to get some of our athletes to go to their sport. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, in Canada, we do talk to the other sports, and sometimes there'll be athletes that come into our system. Um, we've had this a number of times where they don't quite fit, but they're very good athletes, and they, they're, they're more suited for another sport. So we'll actually um, talk to them about going to another sport, and, and vice versa. Other sports will talk to us about an athlete coming to our sport. So mm -hmm. um, it does happen both ways. Um, I think the... You know, a good athlete is a good athlete, and if they're out there, we have it's you know it's our duty as a sport and as coaches to ensure that we find the right spot for them if they're you know if they're if they're motivated. So it's great to hear that there's dialogue at the senior level between the uh, administrators um, in the different sports. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know I, I I talk to my colleagues at the high performance director level quite frequently. Um, we're we're always discussing how we can make our sports better. Um, but also in terms of athletes and seeing whether there's any sort of synergies between some athletes that could help their sport or vice versa. So um, I think we're uh, quite fortunate in Canada right now. We have a very strong sort of governing body called On the Podium that's kind of leading and um, directing a lot of sport and um, being very supportive of what we're doing as, as national sports organizations. And I think that's uh, um, been a huge plus for Canadian sport. And I think, um, you know, sports are really willing and engaging to be uh, become as good as we can um, and that's and, and on the podium has been a um, direct uh, reason for that. Now you are um, rowing Canada Aviron, the clues in the name, you're supposed to be a, a bilingual organization, how does that actually work in practice? Um, well like all things in Canada, um, every organization and every um, is, is, should be bilingual. Um, I know that um, I personally am taking French lessons because I want to be able to give interviews in 2016 in <laughs> French. So <laughs> I'll be the first to interview you, Peter. I'll sharpen up my French myself. <laughs> um, no, and I think it's absolutely right that it should be that way. I mean, Canada is is an inclusive society, and um, you know, a large part of our population is um, is is French speaking. So we have an obligation to do the best we can to support everyone that's in our country in terms of if they want to take up our sport, that we should um, provide avenues to do that. So um, I think it's um, I think it's important that we have um, speakers within our organization who um, who can speak both languages. And uh, my last question, and I have to say that this is a, a, an inside job. I did some research on you. What's the story about you and Shania Twain? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I have to admit I do like Shania Twain, um, but mainly because of her story. I'm not sure if you know of her story, but she comes from a fairly small town um, fairly small town in, in Ontario, the province that I'm currently situated in, in Canada. Um, but hers is a story of, of hard work and determination, which is, I think, what all athletes need to get to the top. And um, certainly she put in a lot of hard work, a lot of grafting, a lot of uh, disappointments along the way as well. Um, but she kept her nose to the grindstone and she did a lot of smart things to get to the top. And I think that's um, um, her, her lessons and her story, along with her, her, her great voice and uh, singing ability. I think it's been, um, she's kind of a, a little bit of a hero to me in terms of what she's come through and everything that she's done to get. Yep, I admit I'm a Shania Twain, Twain fan, I'll, and um, I'll uh, I'll sing a song for you anytime, one of her songs. Right, <laughs> well, like that will be the closing <laughs> credits uh, in French, obviously, when, when I interview you uh, in Rio. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, so much. It's been a delight to have you uh, on Rowing Chats and, and to get a flavour of um, one of the less prominent sides of, of the sport and how it's run. Um, we're just going to show a slide of how viewers can follow you and get in touch. And personally, I definitely need to learn more about your platform to the podium um, uh, program. And Peter has very kindly donated a Rowing Canada Aviron cap, which we're going to give away in this month's free prize draw for everyone who's on the Row Perfect UK newsletter list. Uh, if you're on this chat, you'll be added to the list if you haven't already joined. Uh, please join up. 
Uh, we very, very look forward to having you there. There are lots of special offers that only go to people on the newsletter list and, of course, the opportunity to have this very fine cap. Peter, any last words from you? Well, no, thank you, Rebecca, for, for having me on and thanks to your listeners for, um, for tuning in. Um, please feel free if you have any questions or if I didn't answer your question uh, to your satisfaction. I think there's contact details that have uh, been given to Rebecca. Um, and feel free to contact me and I'll try to answer them um, as, as quick as I can. I will be busy this week. We have our coaches conference here in Canada, this, which is to take place in London, Ontario. Um, but uh, so if you're available and want to come to a good coaches conference, come along. And uh, otherwise, thanks very much. Brilliant. Peter's Twitter address is uh, on the screen. It's at P underscore Cookson. And uh, that will be the route I'd suggest for any questions. Thanks, everybody, for coming along on Rowing Chat this month. And uh, we look very much forward to hearing you again on with us next month. Bye, everyone. <laughs>